hey you guys it is tuesday this is trisha turner this is another episode of anything but average achieving success in life and i have my good friend with me erica today erica is here locally with me um coming to you guys from fulcher texas mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. erica has quite a story to tell um and i think it's she's like the perfect person to talk to today um because there's a lot of struggling out there in the world unfortunately and so I want Erica to A, tell everybody what she does for a living, um, her kind of her position, her role, and then we're gonna get right into her story. So welcome, Erica. Thank you. So my name is Erica DeYoung. I'm here in Fulcher. I have four children and I work for AFLAC. So um, I am a district coordinator with AFLAC. So um, I have um, a district here in Houston and uh, several people that work for me. Uh, doing the same thing that I'm doing, which is um, basically just providing insurance for small companies and large companies. But um, Affleck is a great company and I've had a ton of fun working with them. And for everyone that probably hears Affleck, I'm sure they think of the duck and you get that all mm -hmm. the time, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, the way I say Affleck, everybody goes, oh, my gosh, you say it like a duck. So. <laughs> And I never really even understood you know. what Affleck was until you came into our office and talked to I, us. And I was like, okay, I guess I was, I just knew it was something to do with insurance. Yeah. I wasn't really sure what, mm -hmm. you know, most people don't know. No, most people don't know. And even when they think they do know, they're still missing a huge part of it. But yes, no, it's very common. Everybody knows the duck. Nobody knows what the duck does. No, they don't. And we'll talk about Affleck's for you guys mm -hmm. that are wondering what it is and if it can help you guys in your business. We'll talk about that too. But I want her to share a little bit of her story because um, Erica has come, like she said, she's a mother of four and she's come from some pretty hard times and she is living her best life now, I think. And I made a post this morning about how nobody has a perfect life and they don't, but though it sometimes appears like they do, but I know Erica because she's a good friend of mine. And I know that she is, when you see pictures of her on Facebook and she's being blessed, um, it's because she does the right thing and she takes care of people and God's got a favor on her now because she's deserves it. She's worked hard her whole life and she actually got the car of her dreams for her birthday. <laughs> yes, I did get my, I get, did get my, my car. And I always <laughs> tell people did. it was after 17 so, years of driving a minivan. So isn't that it was crazy? well deserved. <laughs> Do you still love it? Oh my gosh. I still walk out to it and go, Oh my gosh, here's my tell car. Everybody my baby. Got. I got a black Mercedes and uh, her name is pepper. <laughs> so I still, what's really funny is, is that piece of Facebook, I still have people asking me, so how's Pepper doing? As if she was a human. <laughs> like people ask me, so how's Pepper doing? <laughs> Which is kind of That's funny. So cool. <laughs> you look really good in your car too. It's very sleek. So tell everybody. She's very pretty. Because, I love you know, her. Yeah, a lot of times people that are listening are people that are struggling in business, struggling in growing their business. Now, because of COVID, you know, a lot of people are looking at starting new careers. What do they do? They've lost their jobs. And so for you, I thought you would be perfect to interview because you've been in this situation uh, several times. You have several started times. over and, and choosing a different path and choosing mm -hmm. a different career. So tell everybody kind of where it began for you. Some of that, I know I asked that we could share this, some yeah. of that hardest struggles in your life and some of your darkest times, if you could. So I am a survivor of domestic violence. So um, growing up, I did not have a nice, um, calm house. It was filled with a lot of darkness, a lot of abuse. And um, it was, at the time, not something you really could share with anyone. So I'll be 51 this year. And so we're talking about in the 70s and 80s when that really wasn't talked about, even to the point where I did go to a, a high school counselor at one point, and they just really didn't know what to do with what was happening. So it was um, it's not the, it's not the way it is today where you can reach out for help and actually receive it. So at that point, you know, basically what you did was you just hit it really well. You tried to get along um, you, you led a double life and uh, you kept people as far away from from your family as possible. So they weren't going to get hurt. Um, and it was very much, um, like I said, like living a double life and, uh, you know, it, it forced me to make decisions that I wish were different today. Um, as far as, um, I wasn't able to go to college. That was not an option. Um, I 
basically left home when I was 18 because the abuse was getting worse. And, um, and so at that point, my decision was, you know, I'm either going to go out and try life on my own away from the abuse, or I'm likely going to die where I'm here, where I'm at. I'll either end up in jail or, or dead. And so I left and I left at 18 years old and moved to Atlanta to start something new. But those years and years of, um, and then later on, of course, as a mom and as a, um, as a wife, it's very confusing as to what that role should properly look like. Um, and it's also very um, empty, you know, without a father and um, without those roles of, of someone to, to get, a, you know, to get help from or to get feedback or have a trusted person like your parents, which are the people that no matter what are supposed to be your people, like yeah. they're supposed to be the ones that love you the most. And when that's when that is gone and when they are not the people that love you the most, the problem is, is what is everyone else's role going to be then? If those people aren't capable of that in your mind, of course, there's this insecurity and there's um, a lot of self doubt. What was wrong with me? Why did this happen? And that kind of thing. So um, I moved away and uh, had a, a long relationship with my um, ex-husband. And I went into that obviously unprepared for what I, for what a real relationship was going to look like and, and which, you know, led me to basically stay and compromise myself for a lot longer than a stronger person with a stronger background would have allowed themselves to stay for. And so that was, you know, phase two, I think, in figuring out at some point in my life that everything I was building a relationship on was everything I knew from my childhood. And so those, some of those behaviors were becoming comfortable. And like we talked a little bit earlier, just because something is wrong, doesn't mean it's, it's not uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable Mm -hmm. because it's bad, but it's the only thing, you know, and so, you know, it follows the whole thing of why do people grow up in abusive homes and then marry someone abusive when they already know that they didn't want to go out and nobody goes into a relationship saying, I want to do this again, but they just don't know what to know or what. And so your first husband was abusive, correct? So no, he was not abusive. Um, there was, so there's several things I like to talk about in this, um, in this area, there's a lot of different forms of abuse, right? So you have physical abuse, you have mental abuse, you have um, control. Uh, control is one of the things that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up because control is a problem. If you are being controlled by another human being, whether that's um, what are you allowed to eat? What music are you allowed to listen to? What TV shows are you allowed to watch? Um, my first part of my life was physically abusive. The second part of my life is where I compromise saying to myself, well, okay, he's not physically abusive, so it's all good. Right. But it really wasn't because there was all this control of what I could and couldn't do, what size I needed to be, what food groups I needed to eat, how often I needed to work out. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, if I had a glass of wine, that was wrong. If I did this, it was right. It was, it was, it was very, very, and I lived in that environment as most women sometimes do because they have children. And so of course you are raising your children and you are doing your best. And so I think at some point we go, okay, let me just, let me just forge forward with my children and and do what I need to do. And I'll deal with this later. I'll just kind of keep rolling like this isn't happening. But unfortunately at some point I, (laughs) I tend to say that God gives you the extra chip you need in your life at 40 years old. Um, But at 40 years old, (laughs) at 40 years old, I kind of went, what am I doing? Like, Mm -hmm. this is, this is really wrong. And I had a friend um, here because I grew up in Houston and I was living in Atlanta for 21 years. So I was very separated from my friends, which I, which is also a big, a big problem. Don't ever get separated from your friends. They're yeah. the ones that will ground you and keep you in track with what you need to be doing. They're the ones that see. And so I came back to Houston and was with a friend and it was someone I knew since I was in elementary school. And he looked at me and he said, what happened to you? And I just went, Oh my gosh, I don't, I don't even, 
I don't even know who I was supposed to be. I don't even like, I don't remember the person when I was younger, but that person was also confused and lost yeah. and in a very controlling, abusive relationship. And so it's really, really difficult to find yourself trying to find yourself at 40 to 50 years old, um, not duplicating mistakes, understanding your, your mistakes or understanding how the, the, the things that are around you shape and, and mold your decisions. I always say who you marry changes everything about your life from the name you give your children to the car you drive, to the home you're in, to the behaviors, to the food you eat, everything is, is about, you know, is in your marriage. So it really does need to be a give and take. There needs to be this, um, this love that is uh, not controlling. So control Correct. is a big, is a big problem for me. So um, anyway, that to say, that was what I experienced in my second marriage, in my, in my first marriage with, uh, with my ex. And, uh, and so going forward and um, finding um, the, the strength to leave again, yeah, was there was the things. strength to leave the first one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, actually at that time I had three. So um, there was, there was that strength to leave the first time, which was my dad and my house that I grew up in. And then the strength to leave the second time and um, everything that you want is always outside of your comfort zone. And it, it took a lot to, to do that. It's, it's not fun, but it, you know, it's outside of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So, so here I am today and um, I am opening up and talking about the things that happened. And um, there was a, a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories, a lot of um, hurtful things that happened. Um, and, you know, you, my journey with, with faith has been a big part of this and um, not wanting to give those thoughts over every time I look at my children, I want them to be clean, amazing thoughts, not thoughts that have to do with, with my background or abuse or the things that I went through at their age. I want it to be a completely clean slate. And so I think until you kind of address all of that, some of that stuff filters in your thoughts. And, oh, yeah. uh, and that was really, that was the reason that um, that's kind of how I got saved and, and kind of realized that I could no longer hold on to this bitterness and chose to forgive my father and be able to move forward because all it does is just rob you and yeah. it doesn't rob, rob him at all. So how long ago was that, that you forgave him? Um, well, it was actually a story. It was, um, my daughter's 21 and I was getting her dressed for her christening. And, um, and I was bathing her in the, you know, the little tubs you put in your sink yeah. and, and I was bathing her and I picked her up and I looked at her and I thought of my dad oh my God. and I had been, I had been trying so hard. I'd been asking, what does forgiveness feel like? What does it look like? What is it? How do you get there with so much pain? Because of course, a lot of times people confuse forgetting and forgiving yeah. and, and you're not, you know, you're not likely going to ever forget everything, but you can forgive everything. And so that helps that pain go away and, and you get to work through it and you give it away and say, this is no longer mine. I'm going to give this up and it stops now. And so what I realized really quickly when I picked her up and I, I realized what was happening in my head, I just, I, I just picked her up and I went in the living room and got down on my hands and knees and said, I'm done. I just, I don't want this anymore. I, I don't want it. And that's basically when I let it go. Um, it was a, the thing that I always talk about is that forgiveness is actually a decision. It's, it's not a feeling. I don't think it's a decision to let go. Yep. And so the decision is the hardest part is really being comfortable with saying, you know what? The debt's not going to be paid. It's, it's, I'm, it's just going to be forgiven. Yep. And I'm going to let it go because it's robbing me mm -hmm. of the future. And, and I'm not willing to do that. So it's already taken so much from my whole life yes. that, um, that I'm not willing to give it anymore. And so that's, that's basically how I talk about forgiveness. I, forgiveness is a, is a decision. So, um, and that decision, of course, 
helps you move through the rest of your life looking at things differently. So I forgave him on my 21 years ago. Um, he has passed away and he lived here in Houston, which is the only way reason I came back to Houston was wow. after he passed, I decided to come. So, so wow. once, um, once, that, once that happened, then um, I was more in line with coming back and uh, just not subjecting my, I didn't want my children to be subjected to that person. Yeah. So, so once, once that was over, then, then I was able to come back. So there's, there's so much more to the, to the story. Obviously um, there's a lot and, and specifically was, there's you were going too. Through, like all of that, you know, and then going through your marriage like you did and, and being a mom and, and having to put on that happy face that everything's okay. And you have the great life. Perfect. You know, what was some of the things that got you through those dark times? Um, well, <laughs> I think your faith, number one, um, your, your resilience with your children to be that mom and to put your attention into what needs to happen. Um, it is not easy to fake life and wow. life is too short to fake. So living a genuine life is not just, you know, something you say, you really have to figure out what is genuine for you. If you are genuinely happy and you are in a place, and I don't mean genuinely happy as in you have everything you want, you know, the pool looks amazing in your backyard and you're running around in a great car. I mean, genuinely, you're, 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 you're doing what you like to do. You're with a person that you love or you have faith that you will find the person that you love um, and that you have children that are healthy and things are going well. But if you don't have that support system or if you have someone who's constantly draining you or talking bad about you or talking down to you, it's very, very difficult to stay positive. And, and that's for me, my children were kind of the thing I leaned on until I think it just got to the point where there was no way to deny that I was in a situation that wasn't um, good for Funny. anyone. And yeah. actually my, my daughter was the one that, that came to me and, uh, and said that, how long was I going to do this? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so when your children, I, I made a promise to myself uh, when I was back at home that if a child, if my children, if someone in one of my children ever came to me and said, something's wrong <laughs> and you need to change it, that I would do that, that I would not, um, that I would not keep going in a situation that harmed them. Yep. And so when your child comes to you and says, um, wh when are you, when are you going to fix this? That's a real eye opener. And yeah, so I then you have to go into, again, that strong mom that kept everything together has also going to be that strong mom that gets them out. And that had to be hard. So, because then that it's like very over, difficult. you know, it start it's starting over again. And at the yeah. time, um, at the time of this, that this was happening, my mom had stage four breast cancer and was living with us. So at, at the same time that she was struggling for life, um, I was basically compromising mine mm -hmm. to stay in a situation that wasn't good for anybody. And, uh, and at the end, we, again, children always know everything, right? They always yeah. see what we think they don't see. Um, and they knew what was happening um, probably more than I wanted to admit. Probably. And so, yeah. so yeah, so it was very difficult. I prayed. I, it was a prayerful decision. I had many friends that I was going back and forth with. I, I, this did not happen alone. None of where I am today happened alone. I mm -hmm. totally would recommend, you know, your friend group is so important. Your core friend mm -hmm. group that keeps you accountable and keeps you, especially if they're Christian women. I mean, because yep. at some point when your Christian friend goes, God is putting you on a path, which one is the one that, that looks like it's paved. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the one it, it, it shouldn't be um, harmful to be in your own life. No, should no. not, should not. No, <laughs> but like you and I were talking about so many people feel like they have no way out and no hope. That it's is all that's true. That's true. It's going to be uncomfortable 
Um, but just like I was saying before, you know, it's always outside of your comfort zone. It is not easy to make these changes. It's not easy to leave any situation. It's not easy to start over. It's not easy to recreate yourself because every time that you step away from something, you have to recreate yourself. There's, there's always that kind of like your own internal rebranding, you know, because women are one of the only people that change names every time something happens. So right. you go from being this person when you were younger, yes. then you the first <laughs> that you have to change your name every single time something happens. Um, a man can keep his name and it's it, nobody knows anything. Right. And so for us, it's like a rebranding. It's literally a rebranding. I was this person. Now I'm this person. If you don't yes. believe me, look at my name. It's completely different. Mm-hmm. And so there's this there's this all constant rebranding. So but even if you're not in those kind of situations, life has a tendency to throw things at you that even if you never got divorced, even if you had an amazing, amazing parents, which I hope everyone did, um, you still end up rebranding yourself because yeah. changes in life do happen. They and, do. Um, and that strength to leave a bad situation can either be one of employment that's not working out, one of a family situation, moving out of your area to a different one, to to promote more growth for you. I mean, each one of those changes is like a rebranding. Yeah. And so, and for you, and if you have them all at the same time, <laughs> it's a ton of when fun. you did that, you know, I'm sure you didn't have a perfect plan lined out. We never do, no. but oftentimes no. people think, well, I can't do it until I have everything lined up perfectly. There isn't anything perfect. It's just like, do it. You have to do it. I'm you sure have to do it that fear too. What was the thing that like pushed you through where you're like, I have to do this. I'm not going to procrastinate any longer. So in several, in several situations. So when I left home, um, it became extremely volatile. And so the, the mark was, was that, and I met my husband, uh, my first husband and in that time and was able right. to leave. So that was the first one. The second one was a lot of different things. I think finally getting to that point at some point in your life when you realize that the behaviors are not like the behaviors of a normal marriage and you kind of go, hmm, something is not quite right here. And and then you have to make that decision. And if your children are involved and they help you and they say, hey, look, you know, we're ready when you are kind of thing. I think that is a big wake up call, right? That's huge. <laughs> That's huge. Yes. Um, and um, as far as career wise, you know, I got my real, I got my, um, I was working for a home builder and I got my insurance license because I needed a knee replacement, which is a crazy reason to get that. But I had my knee replaced um, at 48 and I was um, at home for two and a half months. And in that time, I decided, you know what, I I need to take some of this change a step further. So I'm going to get a license in one of two things, either real estate or in insurance. And um, I just worked for a home builder and I thought, you know what, I think I want to do insurance. Um, I think that's a better route for me. And so when I stayed home, I did everything that I needed to do to get that testing and and did all of that. And then once I got, yes. And then I took the test. And then once I got the license, I sat on it for two and a half months. I had no idea what to do with it. Um, I I was going towards um, just being life insurance and going door to door to people. And it just didn't seem to fit. Um, First of all, I didn't feel secure in that role, just walking into someone's home that I didn't know. Um, at night or on the weekend. So that's scary, right? That's kind of scary. Plus I was really after the whole reason I left um, the home builder was because I wanted more time with my children. I didn't Mm -hmm. want to give up my weekends and my, and my nights. And so that didn't really fit. And then um, I had a friend that I'd worked with previously coworker that passed away of breast cancer. Um, It was metastatic and it was three years. And um, this is, that was now my third, third friend that had passed away of breast cancer. I've gone through this whole thing with my mother with breast breast cancer. And um, my husband at the time was working for MD Anderson. And um, my daughter was interested in pediatric oncology. And so it just, this whole thing started kind of shaping this way. Um, And I had a friend of mine call me from um, 
from Louisiana. She posted something on Facebook about how there was a cancer policy. And I was just like blown away because how is it that nobody knew that there was a cancer policy? I mean, I've watched friends and, and, and I've seen the GoFundMe accounts and I've, I saw my mom go bankrupt. I mean, I just, all of these things were, were playing out, but I never knew that there was a cancer policy and I didn't understand how we live in Houston and we don't know that. And so from a mission standpoint, policy. So Aflac has a cancer policy and um, it's very inexpensive to to have. If you are with a company that has Aflac, it's going to run you about eight or nine dollars a week. And if you are on your own, it's going to be a little more expensive. But I can I can write that policy. It's going to be about fifty dollars a month. And that cancer policy is super aggressive. It starts to pay you the minute you're diagnosed with cancer and it's a path. As soon as you get that pathology report, you know, you're, you're, they're sending you money and then it continues for the duration of the disease. We've given as much as 130,000 out here in Houston. So there's, it, it continues to pay the whole time. So those times when you're at home fighting the train that's already left the station, that's when that's when these things start happening because no matter what your calendar look like no matter how full your calendar is if you get a phone call like that of one of your loved ones or your spouse or yourself the calendar magically empties i bet because you you have to fight something yeah that's already been going on right Mm -hmm. and so that's that's what the cancer policy does and last year i had um which i don't know that i've even shared with you i haven't shared with a lot of people but i had um a severe precancerous situation that took place no, last you year. Tell me. Yeah, from um, from March to November of last year, and you know, so I was one of those people. I talk about cancer policies all the time, but when it's you and you're sitting there in the office and the doctor's having a conversation with you, and you now need to go to MD Anderson to to see an oncologist, wow. you're sitting there thinking to yourself, "Okay, I have." children going to college, we had a vacation planned, we had all of those things. But then, then you think, okay, so, but I'm as prepared as I can be. Mm -hmm. I I at least know that my kids are going to keep going down this road, that we're not going to go bankrupt, that we have this policy, and that it's going to continue, it's going to start paying us as we go down this road, if this is the road God has for me to go down. Um, so we got super lucky and they were able to do several surgeries and it um, is no longer a situation. Good. So, but that, but that precancerous, even though it wasn't diagnosed as cancer was severe enough in Aflac's world to give you the money. And so my, um, my first initial diagnosis, I had $6,700 in my account in 24 hours That's because insane. of that report. Yeah. So it would have just kept going if I'd need a hysterectomy, if I'd needed anything else, to keep mm-hmm. the, it would have continued to pay. And so that's kind of how I got into Aflac and this life change. And I think there is a comfort as you get older that you decide, you know what, once you know you found something, you know you found it. Mm-hmm. And this has been a very passion filled business for me because I'm able to help someone when I know they're, you know, there's a possible real need. I mean, there's people that have cancer running through their family. They're super scared yeah. and concerned. And, um, and we at least give them some peace of mind um, to help them. But there's all kinds of policies, accident policies. Of course, you see the results pretty quickly. If you have children, you're, you're in an accident, you know, people are falling downstairs and tripping on things and dropping computers on toes all the time. So we've worked that one hard. So, you know, you know, now you're, you've went through all of these trials and tribulations and dark Mm -hmm. places that you have now, would you say that your life is probably the easiest that it's been in a long time? If ever? Absolutely. Yeah. Because you're happy. You're doing something you're passionate Mm -hmm. about. You're in a peaceful marriage, a loving marriage. Yes. yes. And you have faith. It's like, what more mm-hmm. can you ask for? We're very blessed. Not much. Not much. No, no very blessed. Day in and day very, out, very blessed. you still have to get up every day because you're an entrepreneur. You work for yourself. You don't get paychecks just rolling Correct. in on Fridays. So every day you have Maybe to not. get up. You're a woman in business. You know? What's that, that motivating right. thing that, that is makes right. you get up? Because I see you. You're out on sales calls. I love it because it's like you're so driven. And, and you're so passionate about it and you're determined. You're like, you're going to talk, you're doing the work. It's like, you're not expecting anything. Yeah. You're doing the work. What motivates yeah. you every day to get up and do the work? 
So two things, actually. The, the first thing is, I, you know, I have I have children I have to put through college, uh, four to be exact. And so, <laughs> yeah. so that's super motivating for sure. But the other thing is, and this really is the truth, um, I don't want to miss someone. I, I am super afraid of missing someone. Um, I have a friend from high school that was just diagnosed with cancer two weeks ago. Mm. And I keep telling myself or asking myself, did I say enough in his presence? Could I have been stronger? Could, did, I, did I really explain what Aflac does before we set up the GoFundMe account? Is there, you know, because a lot of what happens um, when someone has cancer or when they're going through something is the financial side, you know, you, you want it. It's best to be able to fight something when your mind is clear and you're not as stressed. So stress is a huge part of everything we go through, right? So if you can eliminate something, I can't do anything about cancer and I can't, I can't do anything about heart attacks and strokes and I have no control over any of that. But what I can help somebody do is eliminate a good majority of that stress, which is going to be financial. Because I'm not the only person that's ever sat with a doctor that's heard something they don't want to hear and thought immediately about their children right. and their future and everything else. So everyone else that gets is is doing the same thing. First it's them, then it's, oh my gosh, here are my people in my head. What's going to happen next? And so if I can, I just want to make sure I explain everything because my job really is in education. It is. I, I'm just educating you so that if you walk away and say, it's not for me, that's, that's fine. But in my head, there it goes. <laughs> that was weird. I don't know what that was. <laughs> you know, like I think with people, especially business owners, I just said it when I was doing our training um, Monday in the training room, I told them, you know, think about it. When you're a business owner, what if you get sick? What if you can't go on appointments for 30 days? What if you get freaking COVID or something like that and you can't go on appointments? Your life changes. And especially okay. if you're a sole breadwinner in your family. So for you that you help people that have cancer and have diagnoses and have heart attacks and things like that, that's got to be rewarding for you because it's comfort that you're giving them. Security. It is. We, we love, you know, telling somebody how much they their direct deposit's going to be or how much that tech is going to be or hearing from someone. We're actually talking with an account right now. And the, one of the ladies that's the decision maker at this account, her husband passed away of um, a heart attack. And in that process was in the hospital a very long time. And, and, you know, at the end, not knowing that this person had had this experience when we were talking with them. Um, but she tells, tells us that, um, her husband passed away and she received a check from Aflac for 77,000. Wow. And so she, in her mind, she's like, I don't understand why everybody doesn't have this. Right. So, <laughs> you know, so those are the kind of stories that we hear a lot. And we, you know, it, it makes us kind of, you know, re <laughs> recalibrate with what we do. I bet. And gives us that, you know, so that you can actually really be behind, you know, what you, what you do and, and, and can, ex you know, express that in terms of real what that really looks like in, in as far as money short-term disability is also what you, what you were kind of talking about so yeah. you know if you have a covid situation or you um get into a terrible accident and you can no longer come to work we ask people all the time how long can you go without a paycheck yeah and um i know for myself <laughs> um i didn't have short-term disability when i had my um knee replacement done and Two and a half months doesn't seem like a long time until you're not getting a paycheck for two and yeah, a half months. And then you're like, what the heck? And you're like, a minute. Yes. Um, I um that's a long time. Yeah. After Christmas. So yeah. you have to complete your account after Christmas because you got, you know, all your kids and gifts and everything else. Um, you know, and so short term disability is is a big deal because it does pay you while you're having a situation. If it's an accident, yeah. it starts to pay you immediately. So those kind of things are the things that these small businesses don't necessarily have because they don't have the luxury of being a big business. There are small ones. So the prices are really high. Um, and so that's where we come in with prices that are not, not high at all. So, no. um, 
but it's very it's very rewarding i mean obviously we don't want anybody to have an accident um, of any kind but when someone does call you and says this just happened is 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 this something on my policy and you get a chance to say yes send me the paperwork whenever you you know and i will help walk you through it um and so that's how we stay in touch that's how i stay in touch with my customers is making sure that those are that, that that's happening and even here in fulcher our firemen i just enrolled all of them so they they that's all so cool. i know so going <laughs> yeah, through like all of your the dark times that you did until that's led you to where you are now do you think you found your calling would you say this is it for you yes absolutely you glow you're not, so a, not a question on my mind and then i am for yeah. people like you and I were talking about before we got on in this situation right now where a lot of people are stuck at home, um, a lot of women out there that may be in a bad situation, what is something that you could tell them to give them hope or encouragement? What would you give them a piece of advice? Well, obviously, the first thing that you're you're going to want to do is stay safe. I mean, and, and no one can judge. I used to tell I used to do sales training and I used to tell them. You never know what's happening in someone else's living room. You just, you don't know what's happening in someone else's living room. So it's super hard to judge that uh, and you wouldn't even try, but they, you know, a person has to stay safe. We, we don't, you don't ever want to promote someone leaving and being in a bad situation. Um, and only they honestly can, can judge that there are shelters and things like that. What breaks my heart is, you know, shelters are obviously having to do the distancing as well, social distancing right. and things like that. So the capabilities that they have are super limited right now. And I, I hate that because, um, and, and the children aren't able to go to school. And sometimes, you know, those are the first lines of defense. It gives them time to be away from those situations. Um, and, and like I said, going back to control, control has a lot to do with, you know, punishment, um, you know, bad behavior. And, uh, you know, <laughs> those things, the longer you're with somebody, the more likely you are to have that situation. If there's a break and children are going to school, if there's a break and wife is going to work, there's, there's at least some, you know, something in that day that isn't putting you um, in that situation 24 seven, because that right. can be really, really hard. So my advice really in that in, in to anyone is number one, stay safe first, you know, um, make sure your kids are safe. Second, you know, first and second, you and your children are safe. And then, um, you know, make sure you've got good friends that are kind of watching this situation with you. And, um, and, and try to find a way out. Try if, if that's where you need to be, then get with a church. I mean, you know, see if there's some get with a counselor. Um, th there's all kinds of things that you can do. There's all kinds of outreaches out there. Um, there used to be a program um, called Cut It Out that I was involved in a long time ago. And it was really um, super aggressive because it was uh, your, your it was a piece of information that they put in your shoe is the size of a shoe and it was a shelter number or help oh, number wow. that you needed. And they were giving it, they were um, consulting with hairdressers because hairdressers are the ones that hear so much of their story. Um, it's usually where the police go, from what I understand, to get information about a situation if there's a domestic because women share and they yeah. see markings on their necks, which yep. are typical in an abuse situation. And so um, they used to put information, they used to have something that would slip in your shoe that would give you information because obviously you can't come home if you're in a, you know, an abusive place with a big piece of information that says, you know, how to get out. I mean, that's, no. that's not going to work out well. So, no. so, you know, you just need to be um, careful. Um, but, you know, those, that one isn't, that's a hard one for me because it's, it's a person, every situation is so different. Yeah. And, um, you know, just the main thing is stay safe, have great friends that are going to, keep you accountable and um, look around at the resources that you have in your city or in your county or, you know, and be aware of what you can do. I love it. Thank you for sharing with us today. Absolutely. Your story is so fascinating and I love seeing you being so successful and, and so full of faith and just happy. It's, it's a joy to see. Hey, Thank tell you. everybody how they can reach you if they A, want to hear about Affleck and how you can help them with their business yep. or if they want to talk to you about yep. domestic abuse. Yes. So my phone number is 832 
409-9749. And um, my name is Erica DeYoung. I'm with AFLAC. Uh, my email is Erica, E-R-I-C-K-A underscore DeYoung, D-E-J-O-N-G at us.aflac.com. And I'll drop all of that in the comments too for Perfect. everybody too, so they can reach you Perfect. because you're so passionate about what you do and, and so many people um, need to hear about how you can help them because especially in the world that we're in right now, there's a lot of right despair. Now, yeah. And I think there's probably a lot of people that could talk to you. Yeah. And I'm really, am, I'm, I've been toying back and forth with writing a book on, on the past and um, just making sure that it's the right setting and, and that kind of thing. But I would love to help anybody if that's what they need, uh, especially around the domestic violence. I've talked in groups and done um, certain testimonials and talked to women's organizations and stuff like that. So it's something, you know, that I'm open to if somebody needs something like that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You guys have a great day. Thanks, Erica. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye.